We're going to get a little bit of a, a late start, just a couple more minutes. We're trying to hook up the uh, PowerPoint. So just bear with us for a minute or two. Two, two. All right, um, good afternoon. And again, I, I apologize for the delay. Uh, because we're, we're having some technical difficulties, if there's anybody who would like captioning, we have sign language interpretation. If anybody would like captioning, um, you may please come and sit next to Tina, who is sitting right here in the corner, um, and, and you can watch it on her computer. Again, I apologize for the mix-up. We didn't realize we'd have captioning and, um, and PowerPoint. So um, I'm going to get started with introductions. and. Um, uh, very glad to see such a crowd. There's also chairs coming, so there will be chairs for those of you um, standing in the back, but there's, there's nothing better than an overflow crowd as far as I'm concerned. Um, so this is the second campus conversation of, of, uh, of the year. Um, I'll just yell. The goal of the campus converse, conversation November 1st, which is coming up. Uh, the topic will be climate change, and we've put together a really phenomenal panel uh, of our own faculty to talk about climate change. Today, the topic is Who Gets Counted and Why? Race, Ethnicity, and Latinx in the 2020 Census. We are privileged to have here today with us Dr. Nancy Lopez, uh, whom I will introduce in a moment. Uh, Dr. Lopez will speak for about 30 minutes providing background and context on this issue. Uh, this will be followed by a panel discussion with three of UIC's esteemed faculty whom I will introduce next. Um, and then there should be about 30 minutes or so for Q&A. Um, paper has been provided for you on your chairs. Um, please feel free to write your questions uh, on those uh, slips of paper. We will collect them uh, after Dr. Lopez's talk and then after the panel discussion. Um, and we'll utilize them during the Q&A. Um, I want to thank Professor Janie Breyer, who's been leading this effort this fall to bring in excellent speakers and organize these presentations, and Aisha El Amin um, from my office for overseeing the process and for becoming our emergency uh, IT tech person just now. Not sure where she went. 
Um, uh, and I want to give particular thanks to Dr. Amanda Lewis, Director of the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy, who is actually responsible for bringing Nancy Lopez um, here today. Uh, Dr. Lopez has another talk tomorrow entitled Street Race, Gender, and the Social Determinants of Health in Latinx Communities. That talk will be again tomorrow at 2 p.m. in Auditorium 106 at the College of Medicine West Tower. And there are flyers, I think, um, in the back. Uh, with more information on that, so I encourage you to um, to attend that. It's very simple to get over to West Campus. Just get on a shuttle, take a mile walk, uh, you can do it. Um, so now it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Nancy Lopez. Uh, D uh, Nancy Lopez is an associate professor of sociology at the University of New Mexico. She received her bachelor's degree from Columbia University and her PhD from the City University of New York. Dr. Lopez directs and co-founded the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice, um, and she is the founding coordinator of the New Mexico Statewide Race, Gender, Class Data Policy Consortium. Um, Dr. Lopez is also the inaugural co-chair of the Diversity Council at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Lopez was past chair of the Race, Gender, Class section of the American Sociological Association. So please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Nancy Lopez. Buenas tardes, familia. It's so beautiful to be here in Chicago. Um, I feel at home, even though I've never lived here. Um, and I use that word familia purposefully because we all are members of the same race, the same human race, but that doesn't mean we have the same social status. It doesn't mean that we have the same cultural experiences or that we are located in the same systems of um, inequality. So. This talk today is something that uh, I've been working on for the last several years, and it's really about raising some important questions about the future and the integrity of the civil rights data collection, particularly for Latino communities, um, but obviously for all vulnerable communities. What, what will this mean? So um, the, the talk I put here says the flattening the difference between Hispanic origin and race. What is the cost of erasing the color line among Latinos in terms of data collection? Um, and particularly for serving vulnerable communities and civil rights, right? So I wanna take just two seconds to have you ponder this question. What is your um, race, gender, social location? So if we think about race and gender as social constructions and as master statuses, what sociologists like to think about as positions in society that in most social circumstances overpower all others, even class, even uh, nationality or citizenship, how you are racialized, what racial meanings are assigned to you and what gender meanings are assigned to you are usually the two positions in society that overpower all others. And that is incredibly important for us to think about. I use this um, invitation for self-reflexivity to think about how it is that none of us created systems of inequality when we were born, right? None of us. However, we are all located in these systems of inequality, whether or not it is a system of inequality that makes uh, differences between people based on their class position, what educational attainment your parents had, income and wealth, et cetera, partners, um, whether uh, there's a difference in terms of our able-bodiedness, our sexual orientation, and as you're gonna see uh, as this talk continues, the difference between race, ethnicity, origin, ancestry, it's real, they're not analytically equivalent, and asking about different concepts in one question is very troubling and problematic. So um, consider how it is that each of us is located in these systems of inequality and how we all have different circles of influence. So the uh, nitty gritty, <laughs> here it is. So we have had long standing questions on race that specifically distinguish Hispanic origin and race. So in my case, I would look at this and say, yes, I am Hispanic. Um, I am a U.S. born Dominicana, born and raised in public housing in New York City in the 1960s, right? Um, I would check, yes, Dominican, and then I would look at those race categories and say, hmm, if it were my father who were answering this question, he's very fair-skinned, my grandmother, his mom was blonde and blue-eyed, she'd probably check white. My mother, who is a darker-skinned black woman than I am, would check black, I would check black as well, and probably 
All my other cousins in between might check that other box that says some other race and write in maybe brown, trigueño, et cetera. The reality is that the way that this question is written right now allows us to detect if there's different poverty rates, different housing patterns for Latinos according to the color line. So what is the census proposing? They're proposing some variant of this form that would say, we're gonna just ask about race and origin in one question because that way everyone gets to check all the boxes and you know it sounds really great, right? How nice, we're gonna have information on, if you can see under the white category, it might say German, uh, Lebanese, they put Egypt in there interestingly enough. If you notice, American is not listed there. So the idea that a race is associated with a national origin is troubling because what we're saying is that there's no people in Germany <laughs> that are a different race, right? Like, we know that that's not true. And so for the Hispanic, yeah, you'll check Hispanic and write in, you know, my daughters are Chicana, Dominicanas, they could write that in. But how will that help us serve vulnerable communities? What is the political context, right? We know there's this wonderful book that Bonilla Silva wrote, Racism Without Racist, Colorblind Racism in the Post-Civil Rights Era. And we really do need to take stock of what is going on. Right now, we've had the dismantling of voting rights. We have had Supreme Court cases that are undoing all of the civil rights legislation for desegregating our schools. We have continued attacks on race-sensitive programs. So there's a larger context that is going on here. So the census did conduct two tests, right, to see well, what if anything would happen if we combine these two um, questions, and that's the AQE, the uh, Alternative Questionnaire Experiment, and the National Content Test. And they said that in the end, they're recommending that we go with the combined question. Um, one question I have for the census, and I ask at many venues, but I really don't get much of an answer is, why did this testing take place without the interrogation of a single civil rights outcome, like poverty rates or um, voting rights implications, voting redistricting, segregation and housing, not a single format interrogated. Will this format help me understand inequalities for vulnerable communities or another? It was simply done in the abstract. So I'm, this is part of a larger study I'm not gonna um, mention, but just some of the data sources that I'm looking at as existing reports, videos, webinars, et cetera. And I'm using racial formation theory, um, colorblind racism, critical race theory, um, the matrix of domination, which are theories that come from intersectional knowledge projects. So when we think about the fact that race is a master status that is analytically distinct, it is important that racial formation says that there is a visual dimension to racialization. We can agree that it is a social construction, but there is a visual dimension and that Distinctions based on phenotype, what people look like, skin color, hair texture, sometimes even body type, are real, that that is what racialization means, right? And that these meanings are not simply abstract meanings, they have concrete um, implications, right? Racial formation theory looks at how definitions and interpretations and representations of racial dynamics are occurring at the level of the Supreme Court the census I would put in there, collective identity, social movements, et cetera, but we also look at how this is happening and how this is tied to allocation of resources in different institutions, um, whether it is in communities and schools and also at the individual level. So it is incredibly important for us to take stock of how it is that we're conceptualizing race. Race is multi-level. It's not simply a matter <laughs> of individual identity, right? So. We know this quote from uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, right? The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Right now, um, we need to ask why isn't the census asking this question? And particularly, why is it that none of the social science evidence that goes across many, many disciplines, we're not talking about just sociology, but economics, literature, psychology, political science, the health disparities research all document the presence of a color line. Why was this literature discounted and not included in the decision making, right? Whether we're in Latin America or the Caribbean, we find evidence for these racialized disparities within our communities and that this is not gonna help our uh, communities. So my argument is very simple, color blindness 
or ignoring the reality that Hispanics in the same national origin, doesn't matter if you're, you know, whatever your origin is, even in the same families can be of any race, right? And occupy different social positions based on that master status, what I call street race. And this is part of the talk that I'm gonna do tomorrow, so I won't talk too much about it, but it basically says if you were walking down the street, what race do you think other Americans who do not know you would automatically assume you were based on what you look like? And that that is a dimension of race that we know matters when you show up at the door to look for an apartment, when you are in interacting with um, ICE, right? When you're interacting with people in positions of power, your street race matters much more than what your DNA might say. Anyone in this room could be Hispanic right now, but we all probably occupy different racial statuses. We could all take a DNA test now and find we have 15 different ancestries and ancestors that were in different parts of the world, that is not the same as your race. If we want to understand about racism and how to ameliorate and serve vulnerable communities, we cannot conflate origin and race. They're totally different. So this um, idea of colorblindness is really not serving our communities. We need a moratorium on any changes, right? So this is what the census says. And Regardless of intentions, we have to understand that these decisions have consequences. So the Census Bureau says that over the years, we found that Hispanics have difficulty in responding to the race question. One of the main reasons for the combined question is that it'll make it easier for Hispanics to answer that question. After all, some say that you know they're some other race or whatever, it's, it's complicated, right? They, then we also asked, well, who is this data for? What was the purpose of these tests that they did, the um, AQE and the NCT? And the main purpose, they say, is to increase or um, to deal with a lower non-response, meaning that they either don't answer the question or put some other race, and to have valid and reliable results. But I asked accuracy for whom and for what? Was it for civil rights purpose? What happened to housing discrimination? What happened to employment discrimination and voting rights violations, right? So other reasons that are given, right? Um, it accurately represents how they self-identify, it reduces those that mark some other race. Equity means you have to teach, treat everyone the same, right? That's what equity means. Um, race and origin, that's the same thing. You know, we don't really need to have two questions on it. Everyone is an expert in 2010, so one of the things that has happened is that the Census Bureau has combined separate committees that used to center the lives of specific vulnerable communities like Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, and Asian Americans um, into one. And opponents will say no, actually these are not the same thing. We need, we already have an ancestry question, it's on the American Community Survey. We can get um, specific detailed you know, ancestry on that question, that's a different question, it's not the same as race. Um, equity does not meet the same. So in order to address vulnerable communities and Hispanic um, communities, you cannot ask the um, one question. Equity does not mean sameness, right? It's not the same thing. Um, we need to introduce legislation to protect our data infrastructure. We see what's happening with all the data on climate change. You erase the data, see, hear no evil, see no evil, right? So we, have no, we will have no basis for any kind of accountability and that we should at least insist that the integrity of the decision should be based on the evidence, on the evidence on social inequalities. That should be the minimum bar. So some of the actors that frame the narrative besides the census, of course, are the Office of Management and Budget, Congress, there's a House Oversight Committee, and of course, civil rights organizations. But again, what role will social science evidence on social inequalities play in this decision making? Um, I call these fetishes because they're distractions, right? So some of the reasons that are given is that, you know, we have to use the, the cognitive tests that tell us that people don't distinguish between race and ethnicity, so that's correct, right? So imagine if we did this for class and we said, well, we're gonna use lay definitions of class to measure class inequality. Um, why should we do that for race? That accuracy and reliability are decontextualized from social outcomes related to civil rights. Um, there was talk about expensive real estate. We don't want two questions because it takes up too much space, right? We have to streamline. And um, the abstract liberal frame of equity doesn't include civil rights outcomes at all. And um, this is, again, very, very troubling. So what are the stakes? Again, I think I've made this very clear. Uh, the voting rights, fair housing, employment, health outcomes, and health equity are the stakes, right? Equal employment, education, um, let's see, uh, 
I'm having a hard time reading one of those uh, other stakes, but one of, some of the other issues is lack of um, outreach to vulnerable communities. The translations are problematic. For a while, they were using Indio Americano for American Indian, and if you translate that in Spanish, it makes, it makes no sense. It should be Indígena, and I think now they're moving towards that. There's gonna be an online form for the first time, so imagine someone whose language is not English filling something online, and particularly those who may not have the same level of education or access to internet. And yes, they'll still continue to try to send a postcard and a paper copy if they don't fill it out, but there is a lot of fear right now, especially in mixed status families where some may be documented, some may not. So there's, there's other issues besides the question issue, but I did want to mention that. So if we look at the genealogy of the colorblind projects underway, they've been happening for a while. In the 1970s, there was uh, the establishment of these five separate committees that I mentioned were people who actually had a relationship with the specific needs of Native Americans or Asian Americans or Hispanic Americans. Well, in 2012, that went away. They just said, we're just gonna make one big committee and they will be uh, making the recommendations for all these vulnerable groups. So you see right now that there institutionally has been a change in how even the decisions and recommendations are being made. Um, it doesn't really um, look at any of the existing scientific uh, research in this area. Um, it is paradoxical that there's concern about the real estate when actually now we are gonna have online, so it shouldn't be taking up that much um, space. Um, that none of these measures um, for sexual orientation and gender, they actually, um, the National Committee is recommending that these are separate measures, but they're making the opposite recommendation for race and, and Hispanic origin. Um, the idea that American is conspicuously absent from any of the race categories. I mean, could you imagine if we're, we're saying that nationality is the same as race, well, why is American missing? Um, and then, interestingly enough, it looks like I think almost all the other committees, like the Middle Eastern Committee has already made a recommendation. Um, I believe the sexual orientation has already, but for some reason, the Interagency Committee on Race and Ethnicity still has, and we're still waiting for that technical report and what the recommendation is, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, so we'll see what happens with that. Um, here's some of the evidence from housing. Uh, so there was a study that was conducted in uh, 2012 by the Urban Institute in DC that sent testers to 28, 29 cities across the country and found that it was when people showed up at the door, people who were visible minorities were the ones who were discriminated against. And that again is equivalent to my idea of street race. We also find that LaVise did a study looking at health outcomes for uh, Latinos, finding again that people who were um, identifying as black Latinos had very similar experiences in the doctor's offices than those who are African Americans who experienced an enormous amount of discrimination. Um, Signs and Morales did a book that is incredible, uh, Latinos in the United States, Diversity and Change. They also find that um, there's major differences among this, the um, national origin groups whereby Cubans and um, South Americans who tend to have the highest number of people identifying as racially white have the lowest wage disparity compared to Dominicans who have like the lowest number and Guatemalans and other people who would probably not phenotypically be uh, assumed to be white. So if this combined question goes forward, these studies would be severely compromised. The data is not comparable. I love showing this image because this young woman here represents what most people think of. You know, brown skinned woman, not necessarily looking um, black, but somehow, you know, racially other. But then again, there's tiny pictures of everyone and everything in between, which would say Latinos actually uh, belong to so many different racial groups in the sense that they're racialized very differently. Here's uh, just a slide that shows, again, what I mentioned earlier about um, how different national origin groups answer the race question. And if you look at the white column, you'll see, yes, Puerto Ricans and Mexican Americans, they probably have half people saying that they're white, but for Cubans, it's 85%. For Dominicans, we have the lowest, 30%. And then for South American, it's two thirds. Does it mean everyone that checked that is phenotypically white? No, but perhaps it does tell us there is a color line that is operating, right, among all of these. Um, I want you to take a look at these very handsome men. <laughs> 
and tell me they could all be Dominican, they could all be Mexican, they could all be Puerto Rican. It doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is if they're standing on the corner in a t-shirt and jeans or in a suit and tie by ground zero and they're trying to catch a cab, we know that there's a color line. When they're going to um, the voting booth, who's gonna be asked for extra ID? When they're interacting with law enforcement, right? when they're seeking health care, presenting the same symptoms. If they fill out the new form and say, hmm, race or origin, I took a DNA test and it says that I have ancestry that's Native American and European and I also have African ancestry, they probably all, if all of us took a DNA test, we'd probably find some trace of some origin that is um, from many, many different backgrounds. How is that gonna help us understand the lived experience and especially experiences with inequality for any of these young men who could be cousins, they could all be cousins, they could even be siblings, right? That's not gonna help us. The current format will actually, although not perfect, I'm not gonna say it's perfect, but it will actually help us discern and address the most vulnerable in our families. So um, I use this visual because I think it highlights why we cannot assume that race and origin are the same thing. So uh, who has the power to frame the narrative and praxis, right? Who will win the ontological contest? The ways that we understand, is race the same thing as uh, ethnic origin? Is it the same thing? What about vulnerable communities? Will color evasiveness prevail, right? What does quality data mean anyway? What does rigorous data mean anyway? Will the existing vast interdisciplinary social science evidence documenting the color line and social inequalities in our Latino communities prevail? Or will we achieve colorblind racism? <laughs> and where is the Latino leadership on this issue? It's not clear and it's, it's troubling, I have to say. Um, it appears that the Interagency on Sexual Orientation and Gender, SOGI, took a position against this flattening, at least in the comments uh, I've seen. I, I haven't seen an official document, but it's my understanding that they're saying, no, sexual orientation and gender are not th the same thing. We need separate questions on that, right? And I could say sex assigned at birth is not the same as your gender either, so probably three questions are necessary. Will Latinx organizations and scholars organize to change the narrative? Um, what will happen? It is very interesting. Um, why isn't this question being tested based on the merits of each question for their value added for interrogating inequalities? What, why is the social science um, literature being uh, discounted? What was the research protocol? I would like to know. <laughs> you know, how, how was this research designed? What, how, what kind of different outcome would we have if we had race scholars from different disciplines organizing and uh, deciding on the research protocol. Here's tons of data, again, that shows the existence of a color line in Latino communities, whether it's voting rights, discrimination, housing, employment, criminal justice, health. I, the paper that I'll be presenting tomorrow uh, looks at health in particular with the street race measure. Um, again, are we post-racial? Uh, where are we going? What's the problem with the combined question and everyone checking every origin? How is that gonna help civil rights? Um, how the data will not be comparable. Um, let's see. France doesn't collect any race data, right? Many Latin American countries are beginning to do so. Brazil stands out, but um, Mexico, Colombia, I think even Argentina is now realizing, hmm, we've been colorblind for a long time and there's some communities we're not serving, right? And so it's interesting to see parallel things going on here. We're gonna erase the color line among Latinos, but in Latin American countries for many years, we did not collect this data. They're like, we're not serving our communities well. We need to document inequity and deal with it rather than deny it. Um, Teyes has done an enormous amount of work in that area, but we know that privileged blinds and um, the stakeholders, the people who are in positions to make these um, recommendations may not be aware of the consequences of these decisions. Uh, so I think you know that the, there are, every year there's bills to try to dismantle the collection of any race data, never mind the format, but any race data. So there was a Senate bill that was introduced this year um, that was proposed in Congress to stop that, that the census has already tested formats that eliminate the word race at all from any of the um, 
question formats. And in 1997, there was a memo that the American Anthropological Association sent to the Office of Management and Budget recommending the combined question format as a bridge to the elimination of the word race from any census. Because the idea is one that is well-intentioned. I'm not saying that these are people who are mal-intentioned, but the idea is race is not biologically real, so why should we continue to use this word? It's perpetuating racial thinking, et cetera, et cetera. But we know that race is socially real, right? Like, class is not biologically real, but we still collect, collect class data, right? Because we know that it is a social force that shapes life chances. The same is true for race. So this is, again, part of a much longer trajectory, and it will undermine our ability to address um, inequities. So argument, I'll end um, by saying treating country of birth, national origin, geographic origin, genetic ancestry, language, ethnicity or cultural background as equivalent to race or the social meanings assigned to a conglomeration of an individual's physical appearance such as skin color, hair texture, and facial features by asking about origins and race in the same question, two concepts in one question is a false equivalency. It's a false equivalency to say that gender is the same as sexual orientation and that origin is the same as race. They're different social constructions. And it will compromise our ability to monitor civil rights enforcement and alloc allocating resources for the most vulnerable. Colorblindness is not anti-racism. I love this quote from Bonilla Silva. Anti-racism begins with the understanding that of the institutional nature of racial matters and accepting that everyone's racialized, not just people who are vulnerable. Everyone has a position. Now, what you do in that position is up to you, right? But we're all affected. Every single one of us sitting in this room is racialized, and we all have access to different social circles and um, social resources, and we're affected by that racial structure. Um, so what, are, what is our opportunity to seek a moratorium on any changes, to strategize and build in, um, legislation to protect the little that we have in civil rights data collection, to ensure that the decisions are based on evidence, not um, selective testing that does discounts a whole plethora of research, not just in sociology, but many other fields. Here's my attempt at saying we actually need four questions. <laughs> and so preserve the first two, which we talked about, but also we could, and we do have the ancestry question in the American Community Survey. If we want to know how many people of Irish descent are here or German, we have that. We already have that question, but it's a separate question. Ancestry is not race, right? And then generational status up until the 80s, we used to collect the children of immigrants. And I think that that's very important. So that, that should actually be included. Ideally, I would include my street race question. But more than anything, to explain and do outreach and say, no, origin is not the same as race. Those are different things. President or former President Obama um, was uh, criticized for only checking one box on the census apparently in 2010. So people argued, oh, he's disrespecting his mother because his mother was a white woman. But we know that if Obama were on ground zero trying to catch a cab, no one is saying, ooh, look at the mixed race man. We know that he probably understood these data are used to interrogate inequality. And that's not to say that maybe in the ancestry question he would put, but he, under he understood checking five boxes is not gonna help us we know that when Trayvon Martin was murdered, it didn't matter if he was Hispanic or Asian or Native American. He was seen as a black man. We know that. It doesn't matter what his DNA test said. And in fact, Obama said that could have been my son. His class status was not going to protect him from race, race gender profiling. And so when people understand that this is about whether or not your cousin gets a loan or uh, is treated fairly when they go to the doctors or uh, when they go look for an apartment, that that's what we're asking when we ask the race question. We are not asking what your genetic ancestry is. That's a different question. So I think that, that that's something that we can actually do through outreach and public service announcements, et cetera. Here's a, um, a visual of a book that I um, co-authored with my colleague, Laura Gomez, that includes some solutions for this problem of how do we collect race data. 
This is a visual that I include in that chapter that says, not only do we need to collect self-identified race, how you identify is important, but we also need that street race component, that socially assigned component. We need lived experience, and I'll be talking a lot about that. You know, what is your cumulative experience with um, race, your racial social geography, where did you live, where did you grow up, what was your experience, what are your networks, et cetera. And then tribal status. I live in New Mexico, and let's just say that's a very unique social location to understand, and we know very little about that. Ethnicity is important. Please do not think that I'm saying ethnicity doesn't matter. Of course it matters. Your cultural background, your language background, your beliefs and practices, but that's not the same as race. We need different questions for that. Um, gracias. I am looking forward to the, the plática and the diálogo. So, gracias. Thank you, Dr. Lopez, so much for that uh, fascinating talk. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Professor Anna Guevara, uh, Professor Nadine Neighbor, and Professor Amalia Polaris to come up and join us. Uh, Dr. Anna Guevara is the founding director of the Global Asian Studies Program and co-PI on the UIC Anna Pizzi Initiative. Uh, Dr. Nadine Neighbor is an associate professor in the Gender and Women's Studies Program and the Global Asian and American Studies Program uh, and holds an affiliation with the Department of Anthropology uh, here at UIC. She's also the director of UIC's Arab American Cultural Center. And Dr. Amalia Polaris is Professor of Political Science in Latin American and Latino Studies and Director of the Latin American and Latino Studies Program. Um, our panel will now have a discussion for 20, 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and then we will take the questions from the cards that have been handed out. So please uh, feel free to write your questions now or, or save them um, for later. And I think I'm supposed to. Um, sorry, I missed the cue. <laughs> I wanted to just thank the provost and Dr. Jenny Breyer and Dr. Amanda Lewis for organizing this um, conversation and actually bringing a very timely issue to this campus. Oh, I am sorry. <laughs> Should I do something? Okay. Um, I also especially want to thank uh, Dr. Nancy Lopez for, for coming here and bringing this issue to our campus. And really, I think getting us to think about a more robust um, understanding of diversity and difference, especially at, especially at a time when those particular ideologies are often um, devoid of any emancipatory uh, meaning or also specifically co-opted by neoliberal agendas. So I really appreciate um, having this conversation. And I wanted, I know I have five minutes, so I am going to or three, I think. So I will aim for three, but it might be five. I apologize. But I do want to engage just for a moment with uh, Dr. Lopez's work and also um, pose a couple of questions in the end. Um, one, what I find uh, most compelling with the multidimensionality of race that Dr. Lopez presents in terms of the three measures that I know she will talk about uh, tomorrow, uh, that is um, street race, ascribed race, and self-perceived race, is that they really get us to think about the lived experience of race, uh, providing really a more accurate reflection of how race plays out on the ground. And I know we have long since rejected any kind of biological or essentialist notions of race, and we believe that to be socially constructed. But I think what we don't know is actually how this plays out um, on the ground in the everyday experiences, in our everyday experiences, and also in our everyday realities. And so what I appreciate with Dr. Lopez's work is that she is really attending to your, I feel weird talking to you in the third, <laughs> that you're attending to it um, in a very nuanced way so that our racial experiences are really colored by how we are perceived, how we are understood on the ground, how, we, how these perceptions interact with one another. So really thinking about what you're highlighting in your work of race as an interactive process is really helpful and really inform our everyday life um, experiences. Second, what I 
uh, find useful with Dr. Lopez's work is the incredibly incisive methodological intervention in terms of approaching data collection, which I think we often don't talk about, um, and the ways in which that's, you know, that's tethered to civil rights and making distinctions between what she's referring to as the practice of engaging with quote unquote um, ethical accuracy for civil rights versus quote unquote aesthetic um, accuracy for compliance only. I think that's a really particularly useful distinction. And I'm thinking about that in reflection to the work that my colleagues and I have been doing here at UIC um, and been engaged with since 2010 with respect to the disaggregation of the Asian American ethnic data, um, student ethnic data on this campus. Um, just a week ago, we released a report that really documents the diversity of the Asian American student population at UIC and that has been based on a multi-year study um, supported by the Asian American Native American Pacific Islander Serving Institution Initiative or ANAPC in short and that the work that we've done really provides a very comprehensive understanding of what the state of, what is the demographic of um, this our student our Asian American and Pacific Islander student population here on campus so in some sense I think it's, you know, it's, we're trying to build on Dr. Lopez's work in terms of providing a nuanced understand, racial understanding, but also extending it to call for um, a nuancing of ethnic categories, which I appreciate um, you highlighted. So setting aside kind of the question of the dangers of enumeration in the census, and I know several scholars in this room and elsewhere have really you know, kind of cautioned us in terms of what that means for particular communities. I also take Dr. Lopez's argument about the ways in which resources are tied to these enumeration, and I take that very seriously. So in this context, I think that it's useful to actually think about what Dr. Lopez is um, calling the uh, communities of practice, which I find really useful as a, as a way to anchor our um, our organizing and to really think and rethink ethically how we create particular categories, what questions we're asking, um, and also how this data reflects the realities on, on the ground. And I think the questions and the creation of these so-called communities of practice are actually very, you know, really urgent uh, more than ever. And I'm thinking about um, Dr. Jenny Breyer's um, email that she forwarded to all of us today about um, Justice Roberts' recent dismissal of, the soci of sociological data um, on gerrymandering as what he refers to as sociological gobbledygook, um, right? So I think this is something that we, we are confronting. And so for me, the question that Dr. Lopez is asking, seems to be asking, um, is in terms of who gets counted and why, is also a question of ethics, right? And a question of how one gets counted. And so the distinction between collecting um, data in ways that merely aim to comply to a federal mandate and one that is decontextualized from lived experiences or lived realities, what she's referring to as aesthetic accuracy for compliance only, versus collecting data that is informed by what those implications are, what those implications are for particular questions, which she refers to as the ethical accuracy for civil rights. To me, I think it's a very powerful and that perhaps necessary and very urgent um, need to, or a kind of a guiding light for engaging in any kind of social justice work, which many of us in this room are doing. So kind of two questions I have for uh, Dr. Lopez. Um, one, in the current political climate, um, how might the culture or technology of surveillance that I think you're alluding to um, earlier, especially for particular communities of color in the United States, necessarily complicate um, in knowledge and racial projects. Um, if our goal is to embody a kind of ethical accuracy for civil rights, how do we do that work of collecting data, which many of us are invested in because resources are distributed along those lines, how do we do that work while being cognizant of the realities that particular communities of color face on the ground in the context of this, um, the state technology of um, surveillance. And then second, uh, given your genealogical approach to recognizing racial diversity and racial heterogeneity in terms of how it plays out um, in street level dynamics, how might we theoretically and practically contest also long standing and deeply pervasive ideological or cultural myths? So I'm thinking about uh, the model minority, the yellow peril, 
or the figure of the terrorist are as these cultural and ideological frames that are pervasive. So how do we think about that? Because I know that you uh, place much of your analysis in the framework of colonialism, but how can we also map onto that these ideological and cultural frames to figure out a way to think about um, these lived realities in the context of what, um, how we might be able to address resource distribution or uh, safe, I mean, I don't like the word safety, but just how do we live in this current moment when there's so much attack on our everyday life? So I don't know if I answered that. Maybe we should let the other two ask their very quick. Sure. <laughs> Okay, then I'll just say ditto all the thank yous that Anna gave. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for organizing, and it's such a pleasure to be able to engage with you. Uh, I wanted to um, take up the theme of this balance or negotiation between how complicated racial categories are, as we saw in Dr. Lopez's talk, balancing that with the necessity of being accountable to civil rights outcomes. Um, so, uh, but I'm gonna extend that into the debate that's happening around the current uh, debates around the proposed MENA category, Middle East and North African. So I'll try to be really quick, uh, so I'm gonna talk really fast. Um, so um, ever since Arab, I'm talking specifically about Arabs within the MENA category. Ever since Arabs first immigrated to the US in large numbers, um, Arabs immigrants have encountered the classification around um, access to citizenship. So before World War I, they were classified as Turks in Asia, then Syrians, but all along during that early period, they were always classified, or not always, but the trend was to be classified as European or white, but not quite. Because they've always faced challenges to citizenship based on access to the white category. In the most famous case of 1914, a South Carolina judge ruled that while Syrians might be free white persons, they were not, quote, that particular free white person to whom the act of Congress in 1790 denoted the privilege of citizenship. A privilege, he ruled, was intended for persons of European descent. So that case is really important because it sets the stage for centuries uh, after um, around the precarious racial position or ambiguous racial positions of Arab Americans and Arab American studies scholars have been grappling with this problem until today using terms like the invisible, most invisible of the invisibles, proximity to whiteness, white but not quite. The issue was never fully put to rest. Today, Arabs and other persons with origins in the Middle East and North Africa still fall under the white slash Caucasian category. And uh, especially since the late 1960s, this becomes especially, you know, um, a, a problem or limitation around access to resources and protection from discrimination because post 1960s was the period in which um, anti-Arab racism became systematic. And what I mean by anti-Arab racism is quickly everything from Nixon's 1972 Operation Boulder that, um, where, that put Arab students especially but Arab immigrants under surveillance for activism to the corporate media war that we're all familiar with from the rich Arab oil sheiks to the belly dancers, the terrorists, <laughs> and the oppressed women and queers, um, to today the Muslim ban, surveillance, racial profiling, and hate crime. So you have all of this history of anti-Arab racism, but the communities are checking Caucasian, which, um, which um, on uh, census forms, college applications, et cetera, and I wanna, link that to the stakes that Dr. Lopez referred to in terms of how these uh, larger systematic um, racist structures spill over into the areas of housing, discrimination, um, employment discrimination, um, medical care, schools, um, et cetera. Um, but then folks don't have a category to use you know, to um, advocate for their civil rights. So today, for the first time in four decades, the federal government is considering adding a box for people of Middle Eastern and North African descent on the US Census for 2020. Uh, so that would mean that nearly four million Arab Americans would have the option of checking their own box rather than the white category. Um, of course, some might also be, have been checking Asian or African American. But what I wanna raise for discussion are the complications this raises around the question that Anna also mentioned around the need to uh, kind of um, 
the need to rely on these categories for asserting rights, but also the existing fear around the misuse of census data, using it against the people it's supposed to include, as we saw when the US government used census data to locate and deliver more than 100,000 Japanese Americans into incarceration camps. We have already seen the New York Police Department's recent project that placed Muslim Americans under surveillance under the guise of collecting demographics. And so we've seen community outreach programs, apparently apparent community outreach programs, used to illegally store intelligence on the political and religious beliefs of Arab Americans. And we've seen the Department of Justice and the FBI current surveillance uh, projects that lead to arrest and deportations, life imprisonment, torture, um, and as well as questions currently around this problem of police entrapment of Arab youth. Um, and all of these projects are used to justify counterterrorism um, initiatives. So after Arab American community activists, lobbyists, scholars have been grappling with this question about the category for decades, many community organizations determined the need for policymakers to address their needs in education, housing, access to voter protection, language resources, that all of these needs outweigh the risk and they've moved forward to support the category for 2020. But part of the reason for supporting the category isn't really about outweighing the risks. It's, it's actually that people recognize that if the US government wants to put Arab Americans under surveillance and collect data, they, they're already doing it without the census data already. Um, they're already doing so. And another uh, concern here is the, and this is my last point, is about the, um, you know, mass community-based fear that I write about in my research as internment of the psyche, uh, which is the sense that one is always under scrutiny and at any point could be picked up, locked up, detained, deported. So you have communities at large living in fear. So what would that mean? What would the lack of trust of the government mean for whether and to what extent people are actually gonna check the box? Um, how will people identify? So finally, the category lumps extremely diverse communities together, um, similar to what Dr. Lopez was referring to around this issue of equity does not equal sameness. Um, so communities from people from Turkey to Iran, Israel, and the 22 North African and Arab countries, including minorities from the region, Nubians, Amazigh, Kurds, and many, many more, uh, are all lumped into that MENA category. So of course it's difficult to find a term to capture the diverse needs and the diversity of these communities. Um, but, uh, so I guess I've just closed by saying that the large category is indeed a compromise, but it's something. So thank you. Um, thank you, thank you Nancy for being here and um, so, I guess I want to talk a little bit about this uh, from the perspective of sort of what some of the complications, some of the complexities of um, the Latino race ethnicity question. Um, and I think what prompted the conversations and the beginning of the creation of the uh, combined question, and that is, uh, you know, one of the big issues here. Um, was that, or perhaps the largest issue that prompted this was the fact that about 18 and a half million Latinos uh, right, in, right uh, mark the other, ra other race, right? So that right now, other race is like the third largest racial category in the US after white and black. And so that's, that was obviously a problem for the Census Bureau. It was a problem for many Latino advocacy organizations. What do we do with this? And so I'm trying to kind of say what might explain this in a way that's um, you know, the Census Bureau may say they're confused, right? But I think that what we're talking about is sort of social truths that are very informed by ideology and history of, of why people may be conflating race and ethnicity, right? Um, so one of the important things if we look at sort of both Latin America and then look at the Southwest US and the history of, of the Southwest. So, so in terms of Latin America, I, I, it is a region where the distinction between what uh, Nancy's calling like um, the street race and sort of people's self-identification is really uh, enormous. And it's enormous in a way because of ideologies, nationalist ideologies and ideologies of whitening and mestizaje that make a lot of people kind of not self-identify as being of African origin or being black. And so there's a lot of scholarship on that that shows that that in, a, in and of itself um, is, is complicating because people um, who migrate, if we had migration and people who migrate with very different notions 
of their self excursion versus you know people who are Dominican or you know and, and, and Dr. Lopez knows this very well and others uh, come to the U.S. and suddenly they're racialized as black and those are not the identification. So so uh, you know Wendy Ross has done some work with this notion of race migration. What happens when people come with from other race, racial formations and other ideas of race and they come to the U.S. And so just imagine how, how they then run into a census that says black, white, Asian, and, and, and where Latino's not a race, right? And, they're, and which is understandable because they're multiracial. But I'm just trying to say, so the transposition of these concepts is something sort of that, that sort of we need to kind of understand what may be leading to these conflations and, that, um, and, and, and why it's so hard because you, the U.S. is a multiracial, multiethnic country. So if in a country like Colombia, when they try, because Latin America has gone through its own process of trying, through the work of Tejas and others, trying to show that in fact race matters and that street race matters, uh, but in fact in Colombia, when they tried to uh, start categorizing race, they were able to place several categories because not everyone identified as negro or black, so they would use other categories that people would be more likely to identify that connoted African ancestry. Uh, but those kinds of, you know, that kind of complexity in Colombia, you know, if you put, try to do that in the U.S. with all the different populations, it would be, you know, a huge, a huge enterprise, right? Of the kind that um, I agree, you know, we should move towards to try to do, but in a time of sort of budget constraints where this administration has said it's even, it's not even going to budget the Census Bureau in the way that it could, we're dealing with those kinds of problems, um, and so. Um, so I think the 2030 example you gave is an excellent example of what would be a uh, census, but I would add that for Asian and uh, North African populations, we would need to have more of those uh, you know, distinctions and, and more possibilities of write-ins and so forth. So that's one part. The other part is the Southwest and the history, for example, of Mexicans in the Southwest and the fact that um, you know, we can, you can look at sort of the work of Marta Menchaca or the work of Julie Dowling, different people who've looked at the ways in which Mexicans um, were, according to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, were supposed to be treated as equal citizens, and they, and they struggled to try to define themselves as white, and they were successful in certain realms so that they would not be considered non-white under Jim Crow, right? So there's that history. And so when Julie Dowling finds in her work that a lot of Mexicans identify as white, and she then follows up with them. In fact, they don't really consider themselves as white. It's more ideological. It's more like a way of saying, I belong, and I'm American, right? Um, so that has its own complexities that I think sort of helps explain some of these social truths. And I, the, a, a third and final thing I want to talk about is the way in which race, it, well, there's two more. One is the distinction between an ethnic identity and a pan-ethnic identity, and we're all dealing with that in some ways, right? So ethnicity is people sort of thinking specifically about a national origin or a couple national origins and pan-ethnic, these constructions of Middle Eastern, Asian, you know, Latino, what is that, right? So that adds another level, but the extent to which these pan-ethnic identities uh, work in some contexts is because of like, issues of sort of cultural affinity or racial solidarity across groups or working together, right? So that, you know, um, so that people begin to, in some ways to kind of understand these pan-ethnic identities as racial identities with their lived experiences in the U.S., right? So, uh, so that adds another layer to the complexity of this. And, you know, I'll just give a really quick example. My first job, I lied about my age. I was working in a jack-in-the-box, right? And I was 14, and I'm in Texas, because I grew up in Texas, and I, and I don't listen, I can't hear the order right. So when I, the guy comes up for his order, after he drives through, I give him the wrong order. And he gets really angry, and he said, it had to be a Mexican, right? And for me, that story is always one I remember, because I'm like, first of all, I'm not Mexican, right? So there's that first part where, wait a minute, and then I'm like, well, wait, it doesn't really matter, does it? He saw me, he ascribed, you know, I'm Mexican. In Texas, the way I look, I'm Mexican, right? And so those are the, those, you know, people who, are, who, who go through their social formation in these kinds of environments, right? Um, you know, there's this complicated connection between their pan-ethnic and their ethnic and their racial identity. And finally, race informs na notions of nationalism and nation, right? So here in front is Nilda Flores Gonzalez, whose book just came out, and it's about this notion of how Latino youth, 
may identify as citizens but not Americans. That's the title of her book, Citizens But Not Americans, right? And she can, uh, you know, comment more herself about sort of the ways in which people, people's feelings of belonging or being American or not are shaped by the ways in which they may feel uh, at, at, at discriminated against in the U.S. And the same thing, when you see the other race, a lot of people fill out Mexican. When they say the other race and they give you a line, they say Mexico. So they are seeing Mexican, Mexican-ness, as a racial identity, right? It's absolutely, it's very interesting. And so, you know, and some people use the term raza to kind of connote this kind of mixed ancestry. And that's what the work of Wendy Ross says. You know, some people, you know, she interviewed a Puerto Rican man who said, well, I put other race and I put Puerto Rican because by definition, Puerto Ricans are mixed, right? And that's, you know, part, ideology's working in there, right? There's a lot of critique about, you know, uh, the distinctions between the different kinds of mixtures and the pigmentocracy in Latin America. But I just uh, want to end there because I think, you know, I really appreciate your talk. I really do look forward to a kind of census that looks like the one you put for 2030. But these, you know, all these conversations and all these complexities and the social truths and what, you know, as, as analysts we would like to see, right? Those are all those kinds of uh, con 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 considerations I think need to be part of the conversation. So I'm just gonna take one second to answer all three comments which were really amazing. Thank you for sharing those by making this a question about ethics. So I presented a lot on these issues and one um, presentation comes to mind where uh, the Afro-Latino Forum in New York City convened a conversation with census actors and so forth. And I had a woman in the audience, I don't know what her national origin was, she described herself as Latina, she could have been from any country, saying, what do I put? What do I put? Look at me. I'm fair-skinned. Most people don't think that I'm Latina, but my grandmother, you know, I am Latina, and my grandmother was black. Should I put black on that census? And I told her, I cannot make that decision for you, but let me tell you what that data are used for. And the same issue came up when I went to a museum. Uh, and a young man, security uh, kid, had you know a tattoo with his national origin flag. I'm not going to say what it is, but he's obviously a brown skin, not someone who would be read as white, you know, uh, Latino. And he said, "Well, you know, the only way that we can get accurate data is if you take a DNA test." And I told him, "Look, these data are used to understand." if when you show up at, at the apartment, you know, to look at an apartment, and your cousin who's much fairer skin, or one that's even darker, like you saw Sammy Sosa's picture, are going to receive the same treatment, and, or one is gonna be told, no, there's no apartments for you. Oh, okay, now I understand the street race thing. So when I return back to the story of the woman who was in the audience, who again, very fair skin, and said, I am Latina, my grandmother was black, et cetera, et cetera, what do I put? I said, this is an ethical question that you, no one can make that decision for you, only you can. But I want you to know what this data are used for. They are used for civil rights, monitoring, you know, voting, housing, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, it kind of dovetails even with the Middle Eastern question because the fact of the matter is there's many street races in that category, kind of like the Latino. Asian communities, the same is true. Um, there's a lot of incredible work being done by scholars on, especially um, Filipino communities are the ones that I'm most familiar with, that are often racialized as the other Latino, right, because they're brown. They're seen as Mexican, right? With, with um, my husband often, Chicano brown skinned man, gets asked if he's Filipino, right? So this idea that one way of handling that is, what if we included a category that represented them in between us, the people who check some other race, because it is true. My husband is not someone who would be phenotypically assumed to be white. He certainly wouldn't, he doesn't look like me, he would not be assumed to be black. He's brown, right? But there's no category like that in the census. So um, I think part of it is using PSA through um, uh, public service announcements that kind of explain the difference between race and origin or uh, ancestry. It's, it matters, it matters. So maybe um, that's one way to answer all of your points. <laughs> but r rather than take up all the time, let's just see if we can have a dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think I'll just speak last and then I'll take, give it back. So um, we have a few questions here. Um, but please feel free to, to write more. Um, I think that we have a lot of students here. And I did get one question that is, what is the census supposed to do? I think you sort of answered that. But maybe you could talk 
more generally about what the census is that might be helpful? So it's supposed to be a population count, obviously, right? Uh, so that we can know how many people are here. But beyond that, it is used for civil rights monitoring. So I know I can go on and on and on, but I think I've made that point um, multiple times. So the census not only counts the number of people, so undercount is real, the idea that um, small children are being undercount and, and elderly and vulnerable and tribal community, that is serious because it relates to representation in Congress, it relates to the allocation of resources and so on. So that is the primary purpose, but civil rights outcomes are part of that. This has been happening for a long time, so I don't want anyone to think that this is um, just a slice of what's happening with the new administration. It is part of a long process that includes a dismantling of civil rights uh, gains. So we can go decades back and see the same kinds of proposals coming forward. In fact, this has been tried before. So yes, it is part and parcel of a long process that has been happening um, since the post-civil rights era to dismantle the gains. Um, social justice is a long time struggle, right? So um, there's ways that you could raise this with your Congress representatives. There's ways that you can write comments. There were comment periods that ended already with the Office of Management and Budget and the Census. But it, um, you know, Sonia Sotomayor came to speak at the University of New Mexico several years ago, and I'll never forget that one of the things that a Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor said is, you know, the law is important, but unless we organize, so I'll end it at that. <laughs> okay, are there any other, any, anybody want to ask a question from the audience? Yes, please. Yeah, um, I mean, so this is fascinating. Uh, I'm one of those people who checks Latino oh, and Hispanic, okay. and I get to the next question, and it makes me so sad. Absolutely. Because I have never heard decision, I know as an educated person, and I think a lot of what we're speaking about has to do with a lack of um, levels of education. As an educated person, I know how my check will okay. be used. However, just as ethically, I decide where to dump the money and where to dump the check. Ethically, I feel torn by claiming something I am not. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so, for me, the idea that you're presenting that somehow this latest iteration of the census, which is only 10 years old, or no, 2000 was when this new title was taken, so 17 years old, that this latest iteration of the census somehow cannot be changed and maybe it's changed in a bad direction that forces a correction or solidarity. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, this does create a big issue, and given the number of people who are not checking one of those boxes, I think leaving it as it is um, ignores the truth on the ground that has been spoken mm -hmm. about. And you know, maybe certain demographics from certain countries immigrating have uh, more edu uh, an education level that allows them to check certain boxes because they may be more acculturated the way U.S. people do. Mm. While others of us, um, la raza means something. And to somehow impose a U.S. way of thinking about race, I think, just creates a lot of tension. So I'm just wondering where, you know, I don't think you're proposing to stay the same, but somehow you, you right. are proposing to keep it as it is. So um, the moratorium is just based out of the practicality. They're not gonna add a brown box, which is basically what needs to happen, right? So that people who are not financed, but I imagine that you have family members that are on every color spectrum, and they may receive different treatment with ICE. They may receive different treatment when they go look for an apartment. They may receive different treatment when they're um, walking in the street or going shopping. And that is why we need to make sure that we do not assume that just because we understand that, of course, George Lopez, everyone's gonna, oh, Mexican, right? We saw his picture. But he probably has a cousin that looks like Ricky Martin and Sammy Sosa. 
in our families, we have people of all of those colors. So to say, we're gonna call them all la raza, right? We're, all of them are la raza. Of course they are. They are in the sense that we are a people that come from particular national origins, have a history, et cetera. But that is part of denying the color line. So to say, just because we're recognizing that Ricky, uh, Sammy, and George occupy different racial master statuses, then we are saying there's no la raza. I, don't, I think both can exist. We can actually say there's both. There is la raza, meaning I feel like I'm a family member of this larger Latino community. We all are. But if we ignore that there's a color line and we call everybody la raza, then we won't know who's getting a, a, a harder, who's being racially profiled, who's getting a longer sentence um, in the criminal justice system, who's being disciplined in our schools, then we ignore that. So that's the problem. So what I propose is a solution. Let's try to find a category that captures brownness. And that is super important because, again, poverty rates, everything that we have under the two-part question is gonna disappear once we have the Hispanic category and ignore the reality of the color line. That's basically what the street race is trying to get at. And tomorrow's presentation is going to actually point out, yeah, those who say they're Arab, Hispanics who are told that, or say, I think others see me as Arab or Mexican, which IE means brown, right? These are not people who are seen as black necessarily. Guess who had the highest disparities in mental health and all of that? It was the Latinos who said, on the street, I think I'm seen as Mexican and Arab, brown. Not white. <laughs> Can I just add one more thing? Yeah. Um, so thanks for that. I, I definitely agree, you know, in the way that you're perceived around skin color will make a difference. And then to add to that, so it's not a, in place of it, um, for people of Arab descent and also different Muslim majority countries, it's also emblems, not emblems of, um, of, of your religious, you know, origin or affiliation of your family, it might not even be your own self-identified religion, but if your name's Muhammad, if your name's Osama, you could have light skin and immediately be placed in a brown, you know, or non-white, basically like perception. So it's, it's you're perceived to be a non-white person even if you have fair skin, but your name is Osama and you have a beard and you're wearing Muslim dress um, and or your political um, position. So if you are, also, again, fair skin, but you are, let's say, against the U.S. war in Afghanistan and your name's Osama, um, you know, you're, you're not going to be seen as a white person. And I know that adds like a huge wrench into the discussion, but I really think that, you know, it's partly about how race operates according to different logics depending on the community and the, histor and the history, the historical context of that community's experience. Can I also add? Because yes, yes. um, I've been, you know, I hesitated bringing up my own example, but I'm taking your cue in terms of the Filipino communities. Yes. So if, so I'm thinking about the question, if we were to place the question of how do people perceive you, I think it's hard for me to respond to that question because it would depend on what context, right? So if I were to walk in the city of Alhambra, which is predominantly um, a Latino Mexican community, if I were to walk in there, they will perceive me as Mexican. If I were to be in an, another context in Southside LA, or mm -hmm. I will be perceived differently. Mm -hmm. So I, how do we, I guess my follow-up question would be, for someone who's struggling with answering that question because context matters, and actually I'm thinking of a, um, a colleague of mine who's working on this really amazing work, uh, Radha Modi, who's really thinking about local, the localization of race, how do we, I guess, account for those contexts when we're asking or responding to that question, which is really important and I think provides a more nuanced response, but I just, I'm str struggling with the context. No, I think that's super important. No, of course the context matters. I think in New York everyone knows I'm Dominican. This is what a Dominican looks like, right? But we're black, right? So in um, New Mexico, that's not the case, right? They will, why do you speak Spanish? You know, like that's really strange that they see Afro-Latinos, right? But that's not, but does that make a difference when I go shopping? 
in East LA or when I go look for an apartment in um, Chicago or maybe in New Mexico, is that gonna make a difference in terms of how I interact with police? I don't, at least not when you're racialized as black. Brown, it might. It might be true that in this neighborhood you're not gonna be followed in the store because there's other brown people. But I think the reason why uh, the color line can be seen in Latin America, in um, the Caribbean, in whatever city you walk through, it's true there might be some variations on what specific, but there is a color line, brown, black, for whatever reason, doesn't matter if you racialize as Arab, as Mexican, right? Because we have in our vision what a Mexican is supposed to look like, even though Mexicans are of every color, right? But if you're visualized or treated that way, it seems that the treatment is pretty similar. And the housing audit study that I mentioned earlier um, by the Urban Institute in 2010 found that the discrimination still occurs in housing at stage one, where you call and say, me llamo um, Juanita Perez or whatever, or maybe, I don't know if they specifically tested Middle Eastern names, but they said that the discrimination wasn't as much at stage one where they would hang up on you and say goodbye. I, I'm not, like, it was when you showed up at the door and you were a visible minority. So they found that at stage one of the phone call when you had a foreign sounding name or a name that connoted a particular race, that discrimination was minuscule compared to your visible race, right? So that's why we need to continue to do audit studies and I would be interested in knowing did that include, med I don't remember, but I know certainly they did it with Asian and na uh, Asian sounding names and, um, mm -hmm. and they said it wasn't at that stage where they said no apartments, it was when you showed up and you looked different. Can I just say, I mean, the counting, I know that the, the census is about counting, but maybe just to put it in the scale of how much counting matters in so many different contexts and how we count changes over time, not just context. So, and in a place like UIC, where we have um, a significant number, we're a Hispanic serving institution, serving institution, um, but Muslim um, and Muslim and Arab students can be counted as white, how we understand what we count, mm -hmm. right? Sen so census to say, I mean, to say it's about counting kind of under, I feel like sure. it undersells the important, like how complicated the count is. And then of course what the counting does mm -hmm. is the other piece, but like, in a place like this, we don't even have a we don't have an accurate count of the census of this place. Mm -hmm. Imagine the right the, the counting even beyond that. So I did. Um you'll see that there's the, the New Mexico Statewide Race, Gender, and Class Data Policy Consortium, and part of what we're doing is trying to create a community of practice around intersectionality, and this idea that we need detailed national origin and race separate for Hispanics, but uh, Asian American communities, Middle East, we need all of that. Again, if the ethical issue is serving vulnerable communities and advancing equity and social justice and a more perfect union for all, then we have to contextualize that data collection and center the lives of vulnerable communities. I think there's a lot of people who are uncomfortable with that first grid that I showed that shows each of us, we didn't create these systems of inequality, right? We were all born into this society or wherever it was that uh, we came from. How we interact and what we do with our circle of influence to create a more just union is up to us. And it is an ethical issue. So absolutely, I'm trying to create more detailed data on who are the Hispanics we're serving. We have people like my husband's family who never migrated. They've been in New Mexico for hundreds of years before the United States was formed, right? Well, that's a different person than someone who came recently or who comes from a different social location, et cetera. So having intersectional data matters. And uh, I know that you haven't had a chance to chime in, so I wanna make sure, because I know we're out of time. Each of you had a chance, but was there anything you wanted to add? Um. Um, no, I mean, I think, um, I, I, I mean, I agree with you that having intersectional data matters. I, I think that um, one of the, you know, I'm still thinking about the kind of, you know, some of the complexities of the creation of, of what kind of census would uh, enable us to have categories that are able to kind of connect to self-identity as well as street race. I think it's really important. But I think one of the interesting things um, that we're gonna see out of this I guess if this 
combined question moves forward, is that in the testing of it, um, there, there, there is a real diminishment in the amount of Latinos who identify as white, right? Um, because they have this other category. And there isn't necessarily in the testing, as, as you know, and I've been reading your work, a diminishment in the ones who identify as Afro-Latino. So that's, that's, that's a really interesting outcome, and I think that the more complex the census question becomes and the more accurate, it's gonna really affect our, our, number, our, our counts of whites. It's kinda gonna diminish, so it's interesting. that we will have less data on the color line. So I think it is true. It absolutely reduced, I think it's like 15% now check white, versus like I said, look, 85% of Cubans identify as white. Um, I think it's 66% of South Americans. So now we'll just know that they're Hispanic, but we will not know more, you know, is there a difference in education? Well, Signs and Morales book, I really recommend that you look at it. Not only is there a difference in education, but even once you have that education, there's a difference in the pay that is maps into the color line, right? So one thing I will say, the census most likely, they haven't announced it yet, but the, the recommendation has come forward, will combine the question. That doesn't mean that you all, wherever you're sitting, have to collect the data in that way. You just have to aggregate it to whatever they want. Collect data that serves vulnerable communities where you are. Doesn't matter what the census does. We have, we can work the cracks. It will be harder because people will say, well, the census doesn't want it that way. That's okay. We'll aggregate it to the generic, you know, Hispanic category, but we're gonna serve these communities. If we find there's different discipline data, different arrest data, different housing outcomes, we're still gonna collect it that way. We still have agency. So I wanna remind you that all we have to do is report it back to them that way, but we can collect it any which way we want to. That serves those that are being oppressed. Wait a minute.